Hello, everyone. Welcome to Risk Roundup. Across nations, enormous amounts of data are created by consumer devices in all sizes, shapes, and forms. From mobile phones to the Internet of Things, each of these data contain valuable information about users and their personal preferences and more. Now, with such valuable information, these data become the key to building better and personalized machine learning models to deliver personalized services to maximally enhance user experiences. While federated learning provides a unique way to build such personalized models without intruding users' privacy, we are witnessing an alternative to these practices emerging in the form of AI at the edge, machine learning that will take place near the user on their device or home hub or any equipment or at a local data aggregation point. So how would it shape learning in machines, especially autonomous machines? To discuss learning in autonomous systems further, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Alec Koppel to Risk Roundup. Alec is a research scientist for the U.S. Army Research Laboratory as part of the Computational and Informational Sciences Directorate. And uh, his uh, research focuses on developing new optimization-based methods for learning from streaming data, motivated primarily by autonomous systems. He also pursues foundational work in reinforcement learning, and these threads are part of the U.S. Army's Artificial Intelligence Machine Learning Essential Research Program, and he's based in the United States. Welcome, Alec. We're honored to have you on Risk Roundup. Ah, thank you so much for that uh, introduction. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Wonderful, Alex. So, Alec, what are the trends in learning that you are witnessing? Uh huh. So uh, I think that um, there were uh, there was a significant uh, extent of uh, exuberance following, uh, uh, let's say, deep learning appending the fields of computer vision and natural language understanding and document analytics over the past uh, fifteen years, but. But these advances in pattern recognition require huge uh, quantities of data to be available uh, in advance. And so um, <clears throat> in, uh, in many applications, actually acquiring this data in advance is impossible. For example, in, uh, in climate forecasting, in econometric models, or in uh, taking your Tesla for a brief trip off road or through a tunnel. Um, where there are just not that many tunnels in the world to where we can have uh, millions and millions of examples of driving through a tunnel and losing access to your cloud data set. So for these sorts of uh, scenarios, um, the, the major successes of uh, deep networks still leave uh, still leave a, a gap, and so uh, you know then constantly querying your model in the cloud and and <clears throat> and sending your data off to some you know external server farm is becomes impractical due to uh, latency or changes in the environment. Um, and so for these kinds of scenarios, alternative techniques that try to uh, adapt more readily to the dynamics of the world are, are required. So, um, so for that reason, uh, that there have been efforts to extend uh, uh, deep networks to uh, address dynamical models. These are things called uh, recurrent neural networks or long short-term memory networks and so forth. But still these techniques require millions of training examples available uh, in advance. So, so for for situations where um, you know access to large amounts of data in advance is impractical, or uh, we don't have the ability to constantly be querying the cloud for updates to our model, this this can happen maybe because our car drove into a tunnel, but it could also happen due to privacy uh, concerns. For example, in Europe, they have passed these laws about the light, uh, the the right to be forgotten, and these impose significant restrictions on ability to constantly be querying, querying large uh, cloud data sets. So for these scenarios, it is uh, 
there's an acute need to push more of the uh, processing and at, uh, adaptation to the device itself um, and to uh, allow models to update based on the information that's arriving closer to real time. Um, so for these uh, for these sorts of applications, um, there are uh, techniques that arise from uh, Bayesian inference uh, and other, uh, let's say, popular uh, notions in econometrics that people use to adapt to uh, real time environmental uh, changes. Think of things like the moving average and the autoregressive model. These things start to sound much more attractive when there's not, uh, let's say, when there's not the ability to query the cloud constantly. But of course, when you push more and more processing to the device, then, uh, and you do more of the, and more of the uh, updates in real time, that introduces a significant additional volatility into the system. Um, and that uh, mitigating that volatility in the learning process is still an active area of, of research, I would say. What is the reason of that volatility? Uh -huh. Because, you know, if, if the model is going to uh, evolve according to new data, well, you know, the uh, evolution of new data could be uh, in any number of directions. And so we don't have the ability to do some, let's say, validation in advance of issuing our software patch. Right, right. And I hear you. So now you, you mentioned one uh, obstacle and one problem that you all are facing is the uh, kind of, you know, privacy uh, challenges that uh, you just mentioned about that uh, in Europe and the rights to be forgotten. What other areas where you researchers like you are facing challenges and where we need, which are essential for further development of learning system uh, based on the vision of your research and based on the reality that you all face when you are trying to develop new tools and techniques. Uh -huh. uh, you're saying where are the uh, technical challenges or where are more the okay. challenges of data uh, data. availability? Yes, data ability. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, I would say that actually that is the uh, major uh, challenge for a lot of the um, translating um, of sort of conceptual successes in uh, these kinds of adaptive learning techniques into, uh, into practice because uh, a lot of the benchmark uh, benchmarks that we have are for, uh, let's say, the offline ability to perceive a number of different uh, images from let's say a thousand possible types, but there are not so many benchmarks for uh, real time operation. And so if you look at, for example, the uh, Robotics and Automation Society, uh, the nature of the way they do validation, there's often these, uh, let's say 30 second YouTube videos illuminating a demonstration on some platform. But these are uh, anecdotes. They're not, um, they're not like, okay, here is the, here is the uh, robotic manipulation of an apple, or like here's my robotic arm picking up an apple task. And then like people try to like apply their method that in, to this problem. Like everyone sets up their own custom experiment. Uh, and it's sort of similar for trying to take your a ground robot off-road. Uh, people will come up with these like anecdotal uh, validations, but it's not so uniform the way it is for the fields of natural language understanding or uh, computer vision. And so I think that that uh, the, the anecdote, sorry, the anecdotal nature of that validation has to do with a lack of data availability or some more, uh, I, I don't know, a, a, a standards board of some sort trying to say, okay, this is, these are benchmark tasks for how an adaptive learning system should behave. So, so we are missing that in, in this so field. How do we see that we solve that kind of problems, data availability and those kind of uh, problems, how do we solve that? Yeah, so I think that uh, 
advanced. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, I think that the uh, advances in sensing need to come with uh, the coalescence of a sort of actually, as I said before, at some sort of standards board for what would be benchmarks for adaptive learning systems. So that the field is missing right now. Right now, I, I think that uh, we have a more uh, naive view where typically what people will do is they'll There are there are adaptive same data used for their not adaptive technique, um, and just say, well, as long as I get close to the non adaptive technique, that's good enough. And this is roughly where the state of the field is. But actually, this is not enough because if this if these adaptive techniques are uh, going to operate in the real world, then somehow both their ability to perform close to the uh, not non-adaptive technique is, is important, but also to mitigate the volatility introduced by adaptation. adaptation. You could say, oh, I want my system to evolve to changes in the real world, but in the meantime, I don't want it to do something stupid and like crash into the wall because one you know uh, reflection of a headlight in the tunnel confused the perception. And this could happen, right? Like we don't really have so many safeguards right, right. now. Right. So how, how to solve those kind of problems? Because like you just mentioned that, you know, uh, we don't have those kind of standards and uh, uh, we lack uh, that uh, whole, you know, field where that could give us the guidance. But uh, what I'm also thinking is that if we are developing this system, let's just talk about, you know, the autonomous cars that are going in a tunnel. And uh, if... Uh, at this point, if we the adaptive systems that are trying to learn as it goes, and as they see, you know, some sort of variation, they try to learn on the right there, you know, and uh, try to change the response. But is there any way that we have defined communication protocol, or you know, that we can const even though it's an autonomous system, we there is a way that we can communicate with that autonomous system that uh, this is, you know, how you can go forward or you cannot go forward. And we have some control mechanisms in place and we have control protocols in place that could deviate, you know, if uh, the adaptive system comes up with a solution that we don't want it to happen to, for the, you know, greater good of the humanity. So is there any way that we have, I mean, right now, do we have those kind of control mechanisms in place or communication mechanisms in place that can talk with the system? Yeah, so I think uh, that the extent to which those uh, notions exist, uh, they are very uh, active subjects of research among uh, automobile companies that have their, you know, collaborative efforts with Waymo or Tesla and, and so forth. Um, but there is not any commercial standard. It's not like uh, Wi-Fi or YDMC, YDCMA or the other sort of wireless communications uh, protocols that have a commercial standard. So um, one might ask what, uh, led to the emergence of a uh, wireless com commercial standards that you know uh, allowed uh, Verizon and AT&T to uh, pretty much corner the market and flourish. Um, and actually it was people from the telecommunications industry that wrote those laws for, for the most part. Uh, so um, I think once the research is sure enough, then uh, the emergence of those standards may uh, may happen organically, but, but often things don't happen organically and there needs to be a uh, forcing function from the political sphere to actually get all these different um, 
I don't know, to try to herd all these different cats, which is the Tesla version and the Waymo version and the Ford version and so forth, to try to figure out, okay, so what are the standards that these uh, systems need to uh, follow in order to have some amount of safe, at uh, autonomous adaptation, but but we're definitely not there yet. We are not there yet. I hear you. Now we are witnessing the battles for these AI solutions and all kinds of different techni uh, techniques oscillating between like centralized version or a decentralized model. You uh -huh. know, that, that's where we are seeing uh, you know a lot of more movement happening. So what are the drivers and influencers that decides whether we need to have a centralized system or we should have a decentralized you know system for learning? So I can know about where I think uh, one will be better or worse. And I think that uh, that, that that is often a, a driver of, of trends, but, but, but not always, right? So for example, uh, the creation of uh, a natural language understanding, which gives rise to like Siri and Alexa, these were trained in a very uh, centralized way originally. And so these will not pick up, um, let's say local heterogeneity, people's accents or their particular speech patterns. Maybe uh, one has a likelihood to use certain sorts of anecdotes among their family, which are completely incomprehensible to Siri. So Siri will not, understand those things. I, I don't think that she understands, uh, for example, what is good for the goose is good for the gander. Or there are these kind of oddities. Um, and so for those points where um, there's hetero, the, the, the population's behavior is heterogeneous, then it makes sense to zoom in more and push more and the learning to the local level. So that, uh, so I guess, that uh, that in and of itself drives decentralization because um, you want to respect those differences rather than to just assume that everyone says, I'm, I can only say sentences like, I'm going to the park um, mm -hmm. that everyone understands. So, so this has just been explained in the context of uh, <clears throat> natural language understanding, but there are many, uh, many examples of this that crap up in day-to-day uh, -day life, especially uh, healthcare. Uh, people are very different from one another. I'll never forget when looks so different from one another someone's each person's kidney is, is as different from one another as is their face so uh, then that will give rise to differences of symptoms differences of uh, risk and sensitivity to different tests so and and so forth so in healthcare this is a big issue um, but I think in I think in recommendation of movies maybe it's not that big of a deal like if people are like, oh, I want to I want to browse the category of Oscar winning movies, then, you know, homogeneous recommendation is OK. Yes. So, so that's what's really driving uh, decentralization versus centralization is when is a uniform uh, when is a uniform suggestion good enough? And so when CVS is trying to decide what to include by the register, well, it's a good bet that Reese's and gum and an Advil will do. Um, and that doesn't change much from Seattle to rural Arkansas. Yes, yes, very true. Now, uh, any autonomous system, it must be capable of learning from all the previous experience and then take action based on what it has learned. So how is the autonomy enabled as you design learning systems? How is it uh, amenable? Enable. Enable. What, what does it, what do you mean by this? I mean, what kind of uh, capabilities that needs to be there? Because I think, you know, autom what is uh, like observe, orient, or uh, decide, act and communicate? What are these fundamental capabilities? I just gave you probably the answer. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Yeah, so it, from my understanding is that autonomy is enabled by the integration of uh, these fundamental capabilities, like we, uh, we can observe, we can decide, we can act and communicate. But as you, I mean, as you design the systems and various, you know, control systems for operating, let's say, you know, Tesla or operating uh -huh. any of the, you know, autonomous weapon or autonomous, uh, any other drones, then what are, are those capabilities, uh, remains the same or do do they you know change based on the system that you are designing for uh -huh, uh -huh. um yeah so i definitely think that uh which uh problem which uh action let's say that you want your autonomous system to uh discern from uh data really determines which data needs to be sensed that is that is true at a at a fundamental uh, statistical level, um, and so I I think one uh, example of of this is um, that they really let's say hammer in in the undergraduate statistics curriculum is something called uh, Simpson's paradox, which is about if you only observe uh, admissions rates of males and females in in college um you would make one conclusion but then if you broke it down by uh major then you would make the opposite conclusion and so this the presence of confounding variables and which variables to track can completely derail uh the let's say behavior on autonomous systems so if we for example i i think we could try to track the uh, corona virus uh, prevalence in the population by just asking people, do you think you have it? But then, uh, you know, but then that's going to be a function of someone's individual like anxiety and paranoia as much as it's going to be a function of the actual, uh, sure. uh, actual virus. So then everyone who has a brief bout of lactose intolerance based, uh, you know, sweating or something will think that they have it right so it's just uh yeah so so figuring out which things to sense is, is critical mm -hmm. um and i think that's still uh where we don't know know much right um sure. when we're trying to do uh active model selection uh during um during the learning processes that we have today, right? Trying to de determine which variables to include in the model. Uh, what we're able to do is only to choose among a collection of predefined variables in some way, but we don't have a clear way to define new variables or to reason about whether something is missing. Um, and so that yeah that's a that's a big open problem um yeah. that i think is needed in order to i don't know broaden the applicability or prevent these people these systems from uh making let's say in incorrect determinations true, true. no that that is a problem and that needs to be a focus that probably we need to figure out a way to keep adding those variables even in the systems, uh, learning systems that are designed, because we don't have all the data or all the information about where to you know, look. For example, even the coronavirus. I mean, yeah. uh, right now, if you look in, in March, it's March time, spring time. So there is a pollen energy going on, and there is also flu going on, and this coronavirus. So the symptoms uh, and the you know variables, what to look for, it's very confusing. The boundaries are blurring between all of this. So we probably need a way to keep adding those variables as we learn more because we don't know everything at this point. So it's impossible for us to, you know, define those variables in the system. Now, the future of machine learning, it seems that it is probably going to be decentralized. Uh -huh. So what should be the approach for the training models? Where do you see uh, this uh, federated? I mean, if we compare the traditional model of uh, machine learning workflows and these decentralized workflows, where do you see 
that we need to focus more? What are the drivers and influencers and where we need to uh, pay more attention as we go forward? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Well, um, I think that a lot of the work, uh, let's say over the past few years about federated uh, machine learning is borrowing um, heavily from the uh, networked control systems literature and uh, something that actually predates even that, which is called flocking, um, which is a pretty much a science of how to determine whether a flock of birds will, you know, lock their 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 bearing and heading angle. Um, so, so in that literature, pr pretty much people have asked, what are the what are the things that the birds or some abstraction of the birds need to communicate with each other to lock on to the same angle and, and direction, right? So it's about uniformity. Um, and, and I would say that federated machine learning today um, is also driving towards trying to make all of the different local models uh, agree in some way. And so um, I think that this is a reasonable thing to do as a first step. But uh, if we think about the merits of decentralization, um, I think that uh, how it, it's an open question how to uh, agree enough on the aspects of the model that matter while respecting the local differences. Right. Um, so, you know, in, in society, we've all agreed that uh, murder is bad. And so we, everyone makes that illegal from, you know, India to China to America and so forth. But there are differences, right? So we don't just say that the same model works everywhere. Um, and so I think that's where federated uh, machine learning could, uh, could go um, in order to better uh, encapsulate those sorts of uh, point uh, points of distinction. No, that's, uh, that's a good point. That's a good point. I, and that makes me remember that in one of your papers, you propose that solving multi-agent st stochastic optimization problem over reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces problem yeah. by allowing each agent to learn a local regression function while enforcing the consensus constraints. I only care about the decisions agreeing. But yeah. even that maybe is, I mean, that, that was one abstraction of how to allow each model to have a different representation but but maybe even requiring decisions to agree uh is, is not always the correct thing so i think it's it's difficult to define uh the appropriate abstraction for how to respect enough differences but also enforce enough similarity. So, so I think this is an open problem of, of federated learning, but, but uh, you know, it, it's clearly, uh, while it's a problem, it's also a, a merit because centralization will never permit this sort of behavior. Right, right, right. Now I hear you on that. So how does multi-agent network learn while only having access to locally observed streaming data? How would it work? Uh-huh. So in this uh, situation, each agent uh, or each node in the network will have a, access to some local data uh, stream. And so typically, depending on the model you're trying to learn, right, you just need to pass uh, local gradient information um, or something called a uh, a local component of a Lagrange multiplier to other neighboring uh, nodes in the network. And then they're able to uh, operate with a similar protocol in order to aggregate enough information to sort of uh, eventually uh, obtain something close to this centralized solution. So these techniques, right, These this is exactly the sort of message passing scheme that I was describing with the flock of birds that, that originally came out in the, uh, let's say, late 90s. Um, so I, I think I think what we're seeing now is the emergence of these 
ideas in sort of cloud services and industrial scale machine learning. So it's uh, they're getting much more, um, let's say, commercial development, which is uh, which which will hopefully eventually give rise to some standards about what are and are not uh, reasonable things to communicate. Uh, but, but we're not there yet. Yes, I hear you. We are not there yet. So based on the research that you have conducted and you are, you know, working on currently, what can you predict about the potential future trends that we will see in uh, the learning technology? Uh huh. That's a good question. So, I mean, I, I definitely think that the drive towards ever, uh, let's say, more powerful computers uh, in and uh, more powerful cameras, um, it you know, it we could crudely estimate that it will uh, continue. But what we're getting close to the sort of physical limits. Uh, or the, the thermodynamic limits in terms of how many microprocessors can fit on a chip. So I don't know that computers will can uh, continue their in their seemingly inexorable progress towards more and more power. Um, so I think as we start to get towards these limits, we will need to be more intelligent about how our model representations form based on data. And so you see some of this happening with uh, efforts to take a very complicated neural network and to uh, say, okay, maybe it takes 50 or something gigabytes to represent all of its model parameters. But is there some way I can compress that down and only lose 1% performance and then stick it on a chip, right? Um, and so I think these miniaturization efforts will allow some amount of the sort of uh, the things that we would typically offload to the cloud instead to be stored in some amount of long-term chip memory that's just permanently on the device. And then the adaptive components will still be happening on the device. So, so, so I see this trend for sure. Um, in terms of how to mix together what is hard coded on the chip um, with with um, with the sort of adaptive components that are happening online, and that way you could actually, rather than querying the cloud, say, "Oh, does this agree or disagree with my model?" I could say, "Oh, does this agree or disagree with my uh, long term memory that's in this chip here?" Um, so, so I think in the next five years we'll we'll see this, and actually. Uh, NVIDIA, I, I know, is already working in this direction for some of their like smart camera uh, applications. Good, good. The, the, that seems uh, you know, very promising. So what would you like to tell our global viewers and listeners about your research, and especially those young, brilliant minds that are out there who are you know, in thinking about getting into this field and solving big problems? What would you like to tell them? Um, I think uh, for them, I would say... Uh, my uh, uh, my ability to form a reasonable uh, hypothesis didn't didn't come naturally. It's a it's a learned skill, and I think that the key to learning that skill is treating uh, math like a language, where you need to learn how to speak it uh, fluently, and this again, doesn't come naturally, it comes through practice, understanding what, how our things fit together. And so, you know, there's, there's always tension in research between people who want to be uh, tinkerers going from practice to theory and the theory to practice types. Um, and it's very difficult to, to tinker enough and then sort of backsplain a theory that, uh, I don't know, uh, tries to clarify what is the phenomenon you're observing. But on, then on the other hand, it's hard to be a theorist to only um, define, uh, to only work on practically meaningful problems. There's always this tension. So I think everyone has to make a deci decision for themselves about 
where along the spectrum they uh, want to be situated. Um, but I think uh, it's much easier uh, to make this decision if you speak the language. And so yeah. that to me is really a, a prerequisite to making an informed decision about how to either tinker in a, uh, in a way that's meaningful for research or to come up with problems that are meaningful for practice. Yes, no, that's, I think, excellent uh, suggestion and advice to uh, see the whole uh, field of mathematics as, you know, language and, you know, be able to communicate with that. You know, that's, I think, the right way to go. So thank you so much, Alec, for participating in this roundup today. We appreciate your thoughtful insight on learning in autonomous learning and our global viewers and listeners would benefit tremendously from the information you provided today. And even if a single decision maker is able to understand the emerging learning in autonomous systems after listening to this discussion, this risk round of dialogue has been of service and we thank you for that. Ah, it's been a pleasure. So thanks so much for having me. Wonderful, Alex. So thank you so much. So Risk Group is a strategic security risk research platform and community. And our ecosystem is the first and only cross-disciplinary and collective community that is made of top scientists, security professionals, thought leaders, entrepreneurs, philanthropists, policymakers, and academic institutions from across nations collaborating to research, review, rate, and report strategic security risks to protect the future of humanity. Add your voice to risk groups. And until next time, I'm Jayshree. Also, this kind of signing off. See you next time. Thank you.